want to introduce, I want to uh, title this particular study, The Inconsistencies of Man Concerning Religion. The Inconsistencies of Man Concerning Religion. We think about mankind and we are logical beings by nature. And yet there are so many times when so many of us at, uh, act rather illogically and certainly we've probably all known individuals who we would look at and say, you know, they're Ill illogical most of the time. And how unfortunate that is because we are unique in this aspect of our being, that we are able to rationalize, to analyze, to figure things out, and not just from a mechanical perspective, you can train some animals to do some of that to some extent, but we can think things out. We can, we can analyze the correctness, the incorrectness of a matter based upon thought. We can think about values. We can think about morality. We can think about uh, something that is advantageous or disadvantageous, and you can go on and on with the analysis, and we can say this is the right thing to do or this is the best thing to do. We don't always have to learn by trial and error. We can think things out ahead of time and come to an analytical conclusion. Now, some of us think more analytically and more logically than others, and I've said that I'm a logician perhaps almost to a fault. I think very methodically, and again that gets in the way sometimes. But different, you know, different ones of us are just kind of wired differently along those lines. But overall we are, we are a logical race or a logical being or species. Now, at the same time, as I said, we are often illogical in our thinking and in our analysis and in our actions. There are a lot of times we act without thinking very much. We don't use our logic. We use our emotions. Sometimes we just use our feelings, and feelings sometimes are, are different from emotions. But man is perhaps at his most illogical self when it comes to religion, when it comes to his spiritual life. Direction in life, what we do, how we determine what we should do and how we should act and what we should do next and what action or direction we should take in life, that kind of direction revolves around certain logical principles. We accept these principles without question, without even thinking about them most of the time. We just know certain things happen in certain ways. You do certain things to achieve a certain end. Again, we recognize the principle, we simply do it. You turn on a light switch when you walk into a dark room because you want light to come on. You don't just walk into that dark room and wish there was light. You don't think about some other way that maybe you can make that happen, you understand you want light, you turn on the light switch. And so we do certain things without even thinking because we recognize that certain logical principles prevail. When it comes to religion though, when it comes to our spiritual life, we throw away those principles. Now I'm saying we in the generic sense and in a general wide broad spectrum, but I think it applies very broadly to mankind. We throw away the principles. The principles that we live by in every other area of life, we know that you have to do certain things to achieve certain ends in every other area of life, but when it comes to our spiritual lives, which is the most important part of our lives, we throw away the logic. We throw away the reasoning. We throw away the analytical thinking as to what constitutes correctness, as to what a person must do in order to be saved, as to how we ought to worship God, as to whether or not there is even any rule to go by. Now we don't think in those, in those ways about anything else, 
But when it comes again to the most important part of our lives, our spiritual well-being, we throw away the rule book. And so, well, what constitutes correctness? Well, you may have your way, we have our way, whatever feels good to you, whatever seems right, and so on. What about what you must do to be saved? Well, it's a matter of your interpretation. We've got our interpretation. And if you feel good and you feel right, then it ought to be okay. How should we worship God? Just go by what feels good. Whether or not is there any rule at all? Well, maybe there is and maybe there isn't. Well, let's look at some of these one at a time and see how illogical so many people think about these things. So many people, in fact, I would suggest to you that a vast, vast, if not majority, at least a huge percentage of people would say that one church is as good as another church. And many of those would even say that no church is as good as any church. Have you heard people say, I'm not really religious, I'm just spiritual. What a bunch of baloney that is. How can you be spiritual without being religious? The two go hand in hand, and yet the devil has done a really slick job in manipulating people into thinking that you can somehow be spiritual without being religious. Do you think God sent His Son to establish the church and to bring the gospel and that is somehow divorced from religion? Somehow you can be spiritual and follow Jesus Christ correctly without being religious? Again, baloney. Do we live the rest of our life by a principle that says one specific within a general category or classification is as good as any specific within that same general classification? Do we live that way? Do we think that way? Well, now again, some people might, might be thinking, well, and here the illogical gears start to shift into place. Let me ask you. Is a Chevy as good as a Mercedes? They're both cars. Is a one-room house with no indoor plumbing as good as a three-bedroom home with all of the customary conveniences? They're both houses. Is a $1 bill as good as a $100 bill? They both constitute money. How about if you try somebody else's prescription eyeglasses instead of your own prescription eyeglasses? Would the one be just as good as the other? Try it sometime if you want to suggest that it would. They're both eyeglasses, though, and they're both prescription eyeglasses. Is spinach as good as chocolate cake? What about cooked beets? Are they as good as strawberries? Is liver as good as a T-bone spe steak? They're all food. Is an F in school as good as an A? They're both grades. Is one person as good to make friends with as another person, say, a rapist or a prostitute or a murderer. They're all people. Well, we could go on and on, couldn't we? Why then do we ignore this principle when it comes to our religious life, to our spiritual life? In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus told Peter, And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Is one church as good as another church? They're all churches. Is no church as good as any church? Some people would say so. What did Jesus say He came to do? To build His church, to establish His church on this earth. That was central to His mission as the Savior leaving heaven and coming to this earth. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, the Apostle Paul identifies that church as Christ's own body. He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all and all. And again in Colossians 1.18, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. In Ephesians 5 and verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for her. Did Christ really go to that cross and die for a church that makes no difference? All of us would say, preposterous to think such. And when we come to the end of Acts chapter 2, when we find the initial spreading of the gospel resulting in souls being saved, the text says in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. If the church makes no difference, then why does the Lord add the saved to the church? And if one church is as good as another church and no church is as good as any church, what church do you think the Lord added those saved to? His church, His body, the church He came to establish as part of His mission to this world as the Savior. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 16 and verse 16 exhorts us to greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ, the church that belongs to Christ, greets you. I think the church matters. Some would say that doctrine doesn't make any difference. The word doctrine simply means teaching. Does it really not make any difference as to what facts are taught in a given situation? We're talking about teaching. Does it matter whether whether little Billy tells the truth to his mama when she asks who wrote with lipstick all over the living room wall? Is it okay if little Billy tells a lie? Does it matter what your doctor was taught when he went through medical school? Would you want him to have been taught accurately and effectively the true matters of medical science and technology? Does it matter that the mechanic tells you the truth as to what's wrong with your car. Perhaps a number of us have gone to some particular automotive shop and we knew there was a problem with something about our car. Maybe we even had a pretty good idea of what the problem was. And we went in and we put it into the, into the care of the mechanic and he supposedly analyzed the matter and then he told us that it was such and such. And it turned out that it was not that at all, it was something else. That happened to us not long ago. Took it to another mechanic and he said, no, it's over here where we thought it was to begin with. And that was exactly what the problem was. 
The difference between the price and the two, and the two matters would have been incredible and fixing the first problem would not have taken care of what we were experiencing to begin with. They were on two opposite ends of the vehicle. Does it matter whether your mechanic tells you the truth or not? Does it matter if the electrician who wired your house was taught correctly as to how a house ought to be wired? You'd sure want to walk in and flip the light switch and expect the lights to come on instead of perhaps turning the refrigerator off or turning your coffee pot on. You'd want everything to work perfectly. You'd expect that electrician to know what he was doing before he did it, to have confidence, to have been taught correctly, to know the facts. Well, if what is taught in these areas is so important, then why in the infinitely more important area of our spiritual life do we think that it doesn't matter what we're taught, what we believe, what our church teaches or stands for or stands upon. How inconsistent. Going back to Ephesians chapter 4, and we look beginning with verse 4. The Apostle Paul stated pointedly that it does indeed make a difference what we believe and what we teach and what we practice. There is one body, he says, and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. I think when it says one there, that's pretty specific, don't you? And Paul was writing by inspiration, that is by guidance from God through the Holy Spirit to write exactly what God wanted him to write. So one set of doctrine that is truly God's will, His truth. In Romans chapter 16, and we look at verse 17, notice that Paul says, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. If doctrine doesn't matter, then why would we need to pay attention to what is taught? Why would we need to avoid those who are teaching doctrine that is contrary to what we have taught, been taught? Why would it matter if divisions are caused, or why would there need to be divisions caused over matters of doctrine if doctrine doesn't matter? Obviously, Paul says it matters. He says to avoid those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's look beginning with verse 9. Paul writing again, and he says, Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and for profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Oh, doctrine matters. In 2 John chapter 1, in verse 9, in fact, John the Apostle writes, Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in or live in or live by the doctrine of Christ does not have God. But whoever lives by the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Huh. Doctrine 
definitely matters because doctrine constitutes the teachings on which we base our Christianity. We live our spiritual lives. Paul writing to Timothy, we take it probably toward the end of his death, toward the end of his life, toward the time when he would be executed and put to death for his work as a Christian, a gospel preacher, and an inspired apostle. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Remember, doctrine means teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So Paul is saying people are going to look for teachers who will teach them what they want to hear. And he warns against letting that happen. He says, here's how you safeguard against that. Teach the truth. Always be ready in season, out of season, when it's popular, when it's not popular, when it's easy, when it's difficult. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. Teach the truth always, and guard against people slipping off into false doctrine. Now, if doctrine doesn't matter, what would it matter that the people would look for teachers who would tickle their ears with what they wanted to hear? But, of course, Paul is saying it does matter. And guard against ever letting that happen. And you guard against it most effectively by teaching sound doctrine consistently and on an ongoing basis. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. And the more we let our listening and our our cells be compromised with hearing shades of false doctrine, the more we put ourselves into eternal jeopardy of slipping off into false teaching and away from the true doctrine of the gospel of Christ. Another inconsistency of man concerning religion is what a person needs to do in order to be saved. And so many people would say it doesn't really make that much difference. Believe in God. Do what feels good in your heart. Wherever your heart moves you, do that and you'll be all right. Well, does it matter how we do things or not? Is there a right way and a wrong way to do things? I would suggest to you, ask any supervisor or any business owner who, for whom you might be working and doing a specific job, a specific task that has a specific desired outcome and ask that employer or ask that supervisor, does it make any difference how I do this or not? Can I just do whatever I want to do here? Could I just show up whenever I want to show up? Could I apply whatever principles I want to apply here? Could I just get whatever outcome feels good to me? We all know the answer. Is there a right way to assemble an automobile? Would you want to buy one assembled just any old way? 
Does it matter whether or not you use the right ingredients in baking a cake? How about if you leave out a really important, pertinent ingredient? How do you think the cake will turn out? Does it matter if while you're changing a light bulb, does it matter if maybe you're standing in a bucket of water? I think we all know the answer, don't we? To all of those questions, it matters how we do things. It makes a difference, a vital difference often. If we consistently realize that how we do something matters in virtually every area of life, then why do we do a complete reversal when it comes to our spiritual life? And we throw the rule book out. And we say, well, I think, or I feel, or this is what mama always said, or I read an article how about read God's book and let's see what it says. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus sent the apostles in the Great Commission and Mark records his instructions this way. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Now, Jesus' instruction there, they're clear. He says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We can put it in the form of a mathematical equation. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. Clear as can be, easy to understand. You have to work to misunderstand it. Belief is one element. Baptism is another element. Salvation is the desired conclusion. Both elements are part of Jesus' instruction. Could we throw one of them out? Because we just don't feel good about it? Because we've never believed that, even though the Scriptures say it plainly? Could we just say, well, you know, I haven't done quite that, but I feel good about what I've done. Not according to what Jesus says. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, when the folks in Pentecost asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? They had rejected Christ. They had disbelieved in Him as God's Son and their Savior. They did not believe He was the Messiah. There were likely people in that crowd that day who had been some who might have cheered on His crucifixion, who certainly probably were there in the crowd and, and believed that He deserved to die. I mean, very possibly, if not probably, these things were there, these, these, there were people there who, who experienced those kinds of feelings on the day of His crucifixion. But now they'd been taught the gospel. Now they had come to understand more clearly and accurately the truth. Many had come to believe on Jesus at this point. And so they asked, what shall we do? The first thing Peter said in verse 38 is, Repent. Now that's a change of mind, literally. But we understand that inherent within the understanding of the change of mind is a change of action. And so he says, you've got to repent. You've got to turn it around. You did not believe in Jesus. You've got to believe in Jesus. You did not accept Him as your Savior. You've got to accept Him as your Savior. You rejected Him. You've got to accept Him. You've got to follow Him. You've got to repent. You've got to believe. And then he said also, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you've got to repent. You've got to be baptized, he says. Now there's the mathematical equation again. 
Repentance plus baptism equals forgiveness. The forgiveness is what you want. The forgiveness is what you seek. The forgiveness is what you need. Because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 and verse 23. You need forgiveness. You need to repent. Repent of your sins. Repent of your unfaithfulness. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That's what Peter instructed the people to do. And Peter, I believe we understand, to be guided by inspiration to tell them exactly that. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Paul said that we must believe and we must confess our faith in Christ in order to be saved. Are both required? Or can we just pick one and let the other one go? Can we choose what we want to do and let the other one slip by? Because we don't think it's necessary. Or because it doesn't feel good to us. Or maybe we feel good just by believing. We don't want to have to do the repenting. We don't want to have to do the confessing of our faith in Christ. We don't want to have to submit to baptism. No, all of these things from these various texts of Scripture tell us that we must do all of those things. Salvation is linked to every one of them. We must believe and be baptized, Mark 16, 15, and 16. We must repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We must believe and confess our faith in Christ, Romans 10, 9, and 10. All of those are necessary. They're all within the general context of salvation. But that's not the end. Jesus himself also said in Revelation 2 and verse 10, that we must live faithfully. We must be faithful unto death. And then he says, I will give you the crown of life. Faithful living, living faithfully, faithful for life. That's necessary as well. In order to receive the crown of life, which again is symbolic of eternal salvation, eternal life. All of those things are necessary. They're all Scripture. We can't pick and choose. We can't throw some of them out. As we turn to the very end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. We're instructed to not add to and to not take away from what God has instructed us in his word. Now, obviously, when we look at all of these passages of Scripture, all of these matters, and particularly when we look here at verses 18 and 19 of Revelation chapter 22, and we could look at other texts that say this the same thing in essence. In God's eyes, it makes a difference what we believe and what we teach and what we practice in our spiritual lives. It makes a difference how we choose to follow God. We must choose to follow God his way in order for it to be the right way. The right way. God's way. In John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words, in other words, my teachings, has one, has one that judges him. 
the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now he says the person who rejects my words, my teachings, will ultimately be judged by the very teachings, the very words that he has rejected. Think about that. Think about that. We turn back to Revelation chapter 20 this time. Revelation chapter 20. And we want to look at verse 12. John writes, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And I would suggest to you this book of books, these are the books that John was referring to. I suggest that that's how we can understand it. We will be judged in respect to how we respond to God's teachings. And we better not be inconsistent when it comes to our spiritual lives. As quickly and as readily as we understand that we need to do things right in every other area of our lives in order to be right and to get things right and to have the desired results, we better make sure that we live by the same principle in the most important area of our lives, our spiritual lives, and we need to get that right. We need to follow God His way, the right way. If you need to change your life, maybe you've not been doing it His way. Maybe you've been just go, been going on gut feelings. Turn to God. Turn to His way. If you need to study some more, get with one of us. We'll study with you right from the Word. If you know what you need to do, if you know that you need to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, and surrender to Him in baptism, and you're ready to do that, then step forward. And let's get that done this evening. If you need prayers of the church for whatever reason in your life, step forward and let us know so we can pray together. If you need to take something between you and God in prayer, please do that right away. But if you need to come, won't you come right now as we stand together and sing?